Addressing climate change as a societal problem requires a healthy relationship between science and public policymaking, grounded in a broad public understanding of its drivers, impacts, and solutions. However, the science of climate change has been increasingly swept up and distorted in a broader crusade against government regulation, and some research shows that the so-called ClimateGate scandal and subsequent attacks on climate scientists have had a significant negative impact on public beliefs in global warming and trust in scientists. As we grapple with collective decision-making to forestall the worst impacts of climate change, effective communication of the science behind it is more important than ever. We spoke with climate scientist Dr. Benjamin Santer and Chris Mooney, a science and political journalist and author, about how climate scientists communicate complex research findings to the public in an atmosphere of fierce politicization and competing demands. We began by asking whether the leading climate scientists have time to be effective communicators. How much of your time do you devote to doing the basic science, which is probably the most important contribution we make as scientists, and how much time do you devote to trying to satisfy the public appetite for information about climate change? I think we have to find the time, and I think it's our responsibility to be leading communicators as well. I had always assumed that if the science was credible, uh, we could just rest our case on the science. It was enough to publish high-quality papers, to establish some human culpability in observed climate change, and that ultimately that would be good enough and that policymakers would take the right decisions based on the best available scientific evidence. But I think the events of the last couple of years in particular have shown us that good science alone is not enough. Uh, as scientists, we have a responsibility not only to publish scientific papers, but also to tell the public, to tell the media, to tell policymakers in plain English what we've learned, what it means, and why they should care about it. How can climate scientists maintain their objectivity as scientists while responding to the politicization and public scrutiny of their work? It's an incredibly difficult environment and absolutely it changes the nature of the communication job of any researcher who is in the field. Um, the good news is that they all at least they can be prepared because they know it's a it's a politicized environment. They know going in that they have to expect that they might be attacked, you know, and, and they might be attacked illegitimately. Uh, in other words, you know, they might have done nothing wrong. They might have stated everything accurately. Nevertheless, it might serve someone's particular purpose to try to smear them, attack them, misrepresent what they're saying. This happens all the time, um, and we know it by now. So any climate scientist going in is going to have to have that set of assumptions. Um, in that context, you have to be super careful to protect your integrity because there's people who are going to be essentially baiting you, trying to trip you up, and you know if they don't trip you up, again, they'll just claim that they did. Another thing that happens when it comes to communicating science in a politicized area is that scientists get accused of being advocates. In other words, they're not just researchers, they have a position, they want some sort of policy change to occur. And there's an important sort of positioning that needs to happen in order to avoid that kind of complaint actually sticking. It's possible for a scientist to communicate that something is a problem, something is serious, and there are various things that ought to be done about it or could be done about it without necessarily endorsing a particular piece of legislation, international treaty, and so forth. So for example, you can say global warming is a problem. If nothing happens, global warming will do this, this, and this to the world. That's not the same as saying, therefore, there should be a carbon tax. Um, anyone with a website can purport to be an expert on climate change and can um, make your life quite difficult uh, and uh, write all sorts of things about you that may be factually incorrect, write things about your research that's factually incorrect, and you're caught in this bind if you don't respond to these uh, things which are put out there on the Internet, then some segment of the population um, thinks that there's something behind these, these allegations or these criticisms of your work. That's, that's, that's a tough one, how you address this explosion of, of interest, um, both real genuine interest as well as, um, you know, not genuine interest. How, how do we as scientists deal with that kind of thing? Do we just ignore it? Um, do we try and engage? And if you do try and engage, then you can rapidly be overwhelmed, can have no time whatsoever to do your own science.
how can climate scientists communicate uncertainties in projected climate futures while giving the issue the weight it deserves? Climate, uh, the atmosphere, the ocean, the sea ice, the biosphere, those are complex systems, and we don't have perfect understanding. We'll never have perfect understanding of the full um, <clears throat> complexity of, 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 those, of those systems. Uh, we'll never have full understanding of natural climate noise and never full understanding of the, uh, the precise details of future climate change. Uncertainty is an integral component of any science, and, and in climate science, uh, the, the, the tricky thing is telling people what we know about human effects on climate and uh, what we know about future climate changes, while also letting people know that we never will have certainty. If folks are asking us for precise answers, um, exactly how much warming will we see in Iowa in 2100, we cannot answer that question. We can tell them that the world is going to get warmer, that uh, the uh, amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is going to increase, that sea ice in the Arctic and Antarctic is going to uh, decrease in extent over time, that sea level is going to rise. Uh, so we can answer some questions, but there are other classes of questions that we can't answer. And getting that message across to, uh, to, the, to the public that there is both certainty and uncertainty in everything we do that's difficult. But again, I think we have a responsibility to, to try as openly and honestly as we can to say, this is what we know, this is what's certain, and this is what's uncertain. And to get across to people, too, the idea of decision-making in the face of uncertainty. The, the difficult problem is, and we face this in our everyday lives, as well as in the climate change issue, how we take important decisions on what to do about issues like climate change based not on perfect understanding of the future, but based on uncertain information about the future. Where should communication be directed in an effort to create a more informed public? You need to know how to target different subsets of the public with your message. So, for example, on global warming, there's this great research done by uh, Anthony Lacerowitz of the Yale Project on climate change showing that there are actually six Americas of global warming, and he segments them. And the, what we call global warming deniers are his dismissives. And what's disturbing is that the, the percentage of the public that's a dismissive has dramatically increased, basically, since around the time of climate gate. That doesn't mean it couldn't decrease again because these things do wax and wane, but, but that's a disturbing figure. So if you're a communicator, you know, you know the dismissives, they're dyed in the wool. Uh, they don't they don't reject climate science. They think that global research global climate change research is essentially fraud. Um, these are not the people that you're necessarily going to reach, nor are they the ones that you want to reach first. Um, so so who do you reach? Uh, you want to reach someone, a subset of the public that is more open but maybe just informationally disenfranchised. They don't have the knowledge. Uh, but if you get, the, get it to them in the right way, then they might be very open to it. It might even be motivational to them. How do you get global warming's message across to different subsets of the public, and what might be some ways of doing that? I think that uh, the work that Matthew Nisbet has done here is really interesting of American University, because he talks about different ways of framing climate research. And you know there are at least five frames, and what's important about the frames is that a different frame uh, activates a different audience and will appeal to a different audience, and some frames are narrower in terms of the audience that they can reach, and some are much broader. So, for example, if we think about global warming, we might talk about a technical scientific frame, we might talk about an economic frame, we might talk about an ethical or moral or religious frame, uh, we might talk about a national security frame, a public health frame, those are some of the ones that are out there, and they all have different potential to reach audiences. I do a, a lot of public speaking. I speak to all audiences too, not just technical audiences, but high schools, junior high schools, um, rotary clubs, uh, churches. I think it's important, again, to tell people what the basic science says and why they should care about it, why it, why it matters to them. What vehicle should climate scientists use to communicate their work to the public? And I'm not sure the extent to which this is being done. It should be done. You know, actually having 
fora across the country talking about global warming and its particular effect on a place. Uh, I think that actually if that was, you know, coordinated nationally, uh, and I don't know to what extent the, the, the administration itself is now doing this, but uh, it ought to be. And then um, in terms of creating new media, I mean, that is really the hardest thing of all. And, and mostly I focused on trying to communicate through the wacky, troublesome, problematic, and sometimes awful old media because they still have so much power and there's still a lot that can be done better dealing with them. In terms of trying to get outside of the realm of dealing with them, the problem is is that, you know, they've got the gigantic audience share. And in order to get anything like it, you have to spend lots of money either, you know, advertising or you know, trying to create something new, all of these things. It's just it's a big, big hurdle uh, in order to communicate to a really mass audience. Speaking from personal experience, uh, here at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, we're extremely fortunate to have uh, a high quality, very professional public affairs department. And they've been extremely helpful in my interactions with the media. Um, I was pretty naive when I first started this thing uh, uh, 15, 20 years ago. They've given me a lot of advice and guidance in interacting with journalists, with um, TV stations. Um, it's, been a, it's been a learning experience, and I've, I've been very grateful that I haven't had to face this on, on my own, particularly in the aftermath of Climate Gate, um, where it's often impossible for you to tell as a scientist when a request comes in for an interview or for information about your work, is this bona fide uh, or is this something um, that uh, is not uh, an expression of genuine interest in you or in your work, but someone essentially trying to manipulate you or manipulate information about you. So I think it's extremely helpful if you're in a scientist and you're doing uh, work that is important and that others have an interest in in the public to have some form of guidance on how to interact with the public and with the, the media. How can climate science be more effectively communicated? Well, one of the things that's been helpful for me um, has been a series of workshops organized by Bud Ward, um, a, a, a journalist uh, who's brought together the leading climate scientists with uh, people from um, the media world. So newspaper editors, um, news anchors, TV weathermen and women. And he's had a series of probably nearly two dozen workshops organized that enable each side to understand the problems of the others. Uh, so what particular problems do um, editors or newspaper reporters or TV um, <clears throat> weathermen and women face when they try and report about climate change? Um, what are their deadlines? What are their difficulties? What are their resources? Uh, and they, in turn, try and understand climate science and what difficulties we face in trying to communicate with the public. One of the things that I think is really important is that there come to exist some kind of division of labor within academia and the research community such that the people who are really good at research, mostly that's what they do. And that would describe mostly in climate scientists. And then you would have a new class of communicators who are more than just the public affairs office because they have some scientific uh, expertise and or some communication expertise. They're sort of crossover characters and they have a bit of a higher status than just uh, this is a PR person. They work closely with the scientists but they're also, they're part of their job is to innovate and find new ways of communicating almost like researchers are supposed to innovate and find new ways of studying things. But I think that there's a lot of people who are just good at translating, communicating, getting the information from the scientific community and handling it properly and responsibly and then actually going out and disseminating it to a broader audience. And I think there should be much better opportunities for those folks than currently exist if that's what they excel at.